Uh, welcome to the Idaho Digital Accessibility Consortium and Idaho Assistive Technology Project presentation of Understanding Accessibility Reports. Uh, this is all part of the consortium to continue to provide some free training um, options for, for people trying to, to get a handle on this accessibility thing because we hear about it all the time and uh, it's incredibly overwhelming. So, uh, one one step at a time. For those of you who are not familiar with me, I am Lane Amaro. I have a um, certification in accessibility core competencies through the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, a master's degree in assistive technology and human services, and 10 plus years of experience providing direct um, client services to individuals who are blind in the state of Idaho through the Idaho Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired um, Assistive Technology Services. I am also an assistive technology user. Um, I've been using screen reading and, and or magnification software for over 20 years and have become very adept at the problem solving these advanced accessibility issues and helping to sort out what's the user not knowing what they're doing and is it really an environmental problem. I think we're on to slide four. Yep. Um, so first thing I want to do is some, de some definitions just so that everybody is kind of on the same page. If you have questions um, here in the room, feel free to, to, to interrupt. Um, if you are on chat, um, Nick is moderating today and can field some of those in the, the Zoom chat as well, so we can catch all of those. And as I wrapped up the presentation the other day, I found that I missed a few definitions. So as we get to the end, we might add a few more. Uh, accessibility. What what does accessibility mean? Because if you think about what it means to access something, you mean can I pick it up? Can I hold it? Can I read it? Um, can I interact with it? And that's exactly what accessibility is. The key component when we start talking about this in terms of digital accessibility and disability and Section 508 and Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and all of those catchphrases um, you guys have all been inundated with. Um, accessibility um, really means can somebody access it if they don't have one's, you know, the ability to perceive or physically interact with whatever it is in front of them. So if they use assistive technology to access um, printed text, can that technology access that text for them? It's one extra piece, and it makes a whole lot more sense in context when we think about our physical environment and accessibility. Um, a lot of what we'll talk about is today in the reports identifying barriers to accessibility. Uh, if you watch somebody in a wheelchair or with a, a walker at the bottom of, of a set of steps, it's obvious that's not accessible to them with the tools that they have to navigate their environment. And unfortunately, in the digital space, that's a little less obvious. So hopefully we can help um, address some of that and help you understand and, and have maybe those aha moments like, oh, that's the person in the wheelchair at the bottom of the stairs. Um, definition of assistive technology, there is this big, huge, long federal definition. Any item, piece of equipment, software, program, um, or system that allows someone to access their environment, digital or physical. In short, this means if a tool can help you get a job done, it's assistive technology. Uh, 
sorry, my slides are all goofy over here. Um, so the WCAG Web Content Accessibility Guidelines is an internationally recognized set of standards that define what digital accessibility is. Um, they're really complicated and really, really big. The core principles of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, could someone perceive this information? Can they see it? Can they hear it? Can they smell it? Can they taste it? Can they touch it? Um, can they perceive it? Operable, can they operate it? Um, and how, what different modes do they have to operate it? Um, is the content understandable? And for the developers in the room, this doesn't apply to the document, is it robust? Are there, there are multiple ways to, to accomplish the same task? And is it going to um, be able to keep up with, with the technological advances that might be thrown in? Web content accessibility guidelines, um, if you were to look at them, are designed for web accessibility. There are several different uh, nationally recognized groups, including the National Access Board that created the Section 508 guidelines that parallel web content accessibility that state that web, these WCAG guidelines also apply to documents. You just, when you look at the guidelines anywhere it says website, web page, substitute the word document. And this has been upheld in a, a few different courts. Um, it continues to, to kind of be the, the standard. So that makes it a little bit more confusing too. People are like, well, it's web content guidelines, not document content guidelines. And there are no document content guidelines, so it doesn't apply, but it, but it, it really does. Um, in all of our major text editors and PDF creators, the softwares that we're using to create document content to distribute to customers, clients, consumers, um, I think I covered all the bases there. Anybody call them anything else? <laughs> um, it, that, or to each other, to other agencies, that kind of thing. Um, they all have accessibility checkers built in to help people understand if there are any barriers to accessing that content. The automated checkers um, are, are just that, they are automated. It's a machine looking for some very technical details, and it's basically a pass or fail kind of thing. Um, as advanced as our um, auto automated intelligence, artificial intelligence technology is becoming, it still lacks the ability to, to implement logic, extract context, and um, you know, apply that human thought process to elements in the document. So the accessibility tester, or accessibility reports and checkers, they're starting points for you uh, in starting to look at what could potentially be a barrier to someone with a disability accessing your document. After an automated check, um, and even as part of the automated check, often you have to do a manual check of different items that it points out, different barriers. Um, again, I, I parallel this to a physical environment. Um, you know, the wheelchair at the bottom of the stairs is obvious, but the path down the middle of the, the, you know, the aisles in the stores might not be so obvious. It, should, you know, it might look wide enough for someone in a chair to pass through. But until you get the yardstick out or you get a, a chair out and you try to go down that aisle and manually check to see if it's wide enough, you just don't know. So these manual checks, um, 
and allow you to add, ensure the validity, the validity of the context of whatever could be a barrier, and you get to decide, is this really a barrier? Which can be hard to do if you're not used to using assistive technology. So again, I'm hoping that we can help with that a little bit today. <clears throat> So the, again, the purpose of an accessibility report is to identify the technical issues or potential barriers of a digital document. It creates a starting point or checklist of things for you to manually examine. And it is not a replacement for your judgment as the document author. And it is not infallible. Uh, I did a, some presentations for the State Department of Education not too long ago, and I had put the uh, universal symbol for disability into my PowerPoint. It was a, the, the blue sign, the white stick figure in the wheelchair. And the um, automated, automatic alt text feature that adds alt text to images for me told me that was a picture of the ground. <laughs> it is not infallible. <laughs> um, and so again, that was something I had to manually check to ensure that it, the checker told me, yes, there's alt text, you're good to go, when in fact that text was, was inaccurate. Okay. So we're moving on to our accessibility checker in the Microsoft Office, um, Office Suite. And as I said, almost all of our major document editors have some sort of accessibility checker built in. Most state agencies are using Microsoft Word for the basic document creation and then saving as or converting to PDF. There are some using InDesign, and which uses the same accessibility checker as Acrobat does. So, um, for those of you who use InDesign, the next section on the Acrobat Checker will be more applicable. And I do know there are a few people in these agencies also using Google Docs. Um, if you happen to be using Google Docs to do your document creation, you might want to check out the Google Grackle, spelled just like the bird, um, add-on for checking document accessibility. Um, I don't cover it in depth today, but it'll be very similar to this Microsoft checker. And again, it evaluates the document's structure for technical barriers to assistive technology users. Microsoft has grouped these potential barriers into three groups, errors, warnings, and tips. Errors are absolute barriers. Warnings are things that um, are slight barriers, kind of like a ramp that might have just too much of an incline that's a slight barrier to a wheelchair user, but not the end of the world. Um, and then tips are the things that Microsoft suggests that you do to really enhance the document and user experience, that customer experience. So um, the errors are things that absolutely must be resolved in that document. And warnings, it's highly suggested that you resolve them. But if you're on a tight deadline, it's not going to be the end of the world. Um, you, if you get a complaint about it, then come back and, and fix it kind of thing, but not the end of the world. The tips, very low priority. If you don't get to it, you don't get to it. Um, however, we all know that as customers in, in all kinds of places, our customer experience matters a lot, and it can mean the difference in somebody coming back or not. It can mean the difference in, in a lot of the work that is, our agencies do. It can make the different make or break 
whether or not someone gets the help that they need. So keep that in mind as you work on your own documents and are considering what do I, what do I need to fix? Um, what's the must and, and what would be the niceties and how important are those, those niceties in that customer experience? Um, so to start the accessibility checker, and Nick, I'm going to switch over to share. Go for it. Maybe. Oh, it says I can't start a screen share. Okay. Hold on. I'm just going to make you the host. Okay. I have created this amazingly inaccessible document. <laughs> and for somebody who does this stuff all day long, it's really hard to make an accessible document. <clears throat> so to start the accessibility checker, you would click on File up in the top left corner. And then in this, um, on the info tab, there is a check for issues drop down, and you can check accessibility. This opens a panel on that right hand side. And you can see my errors my warnings, and it's not showing the tips here for me. They might be visible for you, but they're not for my screen reader. <laughs> no, they're not. I think if you select one, you might get a tip. Yeah. Um, and in the accessibility checker, you can you can see what your your errors are. You can see what your what what they are. I've got missing alternative text as an error. And that shows as my only error. There's actually more errors. There should be document headings. So it should, but if there's that automated piece. It's not smart enough to know that. If you look at the document and if we were to scroll down through the document, you would see headings. But the document, you know, that, that automated checker doesn't see that the same way we do. So it doesn't know that my document is supposed to have headings, and that is technically an error. Um, <coughs> if you click on one of the items in the list, you can get um, additional information on why fixing alternative text is important, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. But then there's also a drop down where, so if you forget everything that gets started at you today, you can come in here and you can click the option to show you how to fix it. So pretty powerful tool. Um, if this image had even one word in there, if I just wrote picture in alt text, this error would not appear. Uh, it would, because it's looking, does it have it or not? Yes or no. So if there was one word in the alternate text uh, piece of the element, it would, tell, it would tell me that this document had no errors. So again, that automated, um, we'll stop sharing, go back to PowerPoint. Okay, let's see, I think you might have to give me this power. I've got to turn through. Hosting back to you? Yeah. Okay, we got it back. There we go. We're good. 
Um, the file option is in Microsoft is also called the backstage view. So if you happen to <coughs> spot some um, other instructions occasionally, that file tab, um, if you're in Office 2007, it's the Office button, big red button in the top left corner. It's also called the backstage view. And some people see that and they're like, what? They're the same thing. Um, so our errors are the ones that must be fixed. It checks for images, basically any image element, any picture element. Does it have alternate text? Does the ta do tables, if they are present, have header rows? And have heading styles been used or not? The only error that it caught in my document was alt text. But I have several tables in that document that are missing table headers. And there is supposed to be headings, but it didn't tell me that there were not. So all of those things might need to be manually checked anyway. Um, some people are probably wondering, what, what is the purpose of alt text? That was a definition I didn't put in at the beginning. Alt text stands for alternate text. It is just another media for or medium for sharing the information that appears in an image. They are important because on some mobile devices and some internet connections, your images won't load for a customer who's who's downloading. And other users may not have the visual perception. Um, whether that's just their color perception or there's physiologically something wrong with their eyes and their vision, or if they have difficulty cognitively understanding what, their, what information their brain is receiving through their eyes. Um, some readers also struggle to separate text from background images. Uh, the image is just too busy and they can't cognitively extract and understand that information. And others might just struggle to understand the context and conceptualize what's this image's purpose? Why is this even here? The alt text can be revealed to assistive technology users and provide them the context of what is the purpose, what is the meaning of this image in this document. And that's, that's the key, is we, we're talking, the, the alt text is a short description of the purpose of the image. If your image happens to be a chart, uh, like the, the pie chart that was in the document I showed just a moment ago, it would be inappropriate alt text to say this is a circular pie chart of displaying 88% you know, of screen reader users report using a mobile screen reader user, and it's 12% you know, report being or not using mobile screen readers. The 12% slice is green, and the remainder, remaining 88% of the chart is red. That would that's an accurate description. That's not the point. <laughs> the purpose of the image is a, is a graphical representation of mobile screen reader usage. So an, the accurate alt text would be a pie chart of mobile screen reader usage. And people are looking at me going, well, then how does the blind person know how many were mobile screen reader users? You have to convey that particular information in another way on, in, in the document. In that doc, uh, that. Um, personalizing the document experience document, that pie chart has a table immediately beneath it with the exact same content. Just one is a picture and one is a table containing text. It's the same information conveyed two different ways in order to meet the needs of both the person who might not be able to perceive the colors in the image or understand the context or the content in the image or might not be able to see the image. 
but then also presents that picture, which might be easier for other people to, to comprehend. Um, I know from a visual perspective, that pie chart is a whole lot easier to, to gather information from than even the simple table that says 88% um, say yes, they use mobile screen readers, and 12% say they do not. So different media, different modes of conveying that same information is valuable for all users. Table headers are the next thing that should be identified in as being present or not by the Microsoft Accessibility Checker. In my document, it should have told me that I was missing some table headers. And table headers are your column headers in a, in a data table. That first row that provides context about what comes at the need in, in the rows below. Um, that is the, the information that is considered a table header. Without table header, table headers present, we don't have context for the remaining data in the table. Uh, you may have encountered tables that, that cut across multiple pages. And if you're on page three, looking at row 55, and you have to turn back two pages to look at the column header for column three, that's really a, a, an access issue for, for anybody who's able to read that print. So that is showing, that, that top row shows context. Assigning that row as a table header in table properties allows assistive technology users access to that same context without considerable navigation turning those pages back. And heading styles, again, is a supposed to be identified as being present or not, but that automated test can't tell you if there should be headings or not. So that becomes a manual test as well. But if you want to understand better why headings are important, just think about why you use headings. In a newspaper, in a long document, you look for the text that is large and has extra white space and might be more bold around it in order to skim and get directly to the context or the content within that large document that is important to you. Again, it, the headings provide context and provide association between the topic or the heading and what you're going to read below it. We can per create that structure in several different ways in our text editors. But in order to also give that same context and association to users of assistive technology, as well as individuals who might not use assistive technology, but who uh, have different cognitive processing challenges or organizational challenges, uh, heading structure can be used to navigate a document as well and serve as an outline to help make it a little bit easier to find what you're looking for. Using heading styles is the only way you can add that technical structure that says there's a heading here, and it's a level one, it's main topic, it's a level two, it's a subtopic, it's a level three, the subtopic tree, as we go all cringe and go back to seventh grade English class. <laughs> and that, those headings create a very valuable uh, document structure for all users, not just those who can see that the text is a different color, a different size, or has extra white space around it. How many people are panicking and going, how do I do that? <laughs> or when I click style, it makes it all goofy and it turns colors I don't like. Um, in the packet I emailed to everyone who RSVP'd yesterday, um, you should find an Accessibility Basics document called Accessibility Basics Headings. And that goes over how to check to see if your document has headings. And if it does not, how you can apply headings. And also how you can apply a heading without changing what it already looks like. 
Those documents were all created using Office 365. So the screenshots may be a little, a little different than what you might see on your computer. Um, there's also the Accessibility Basics Tables document that goes over table headers. How do I identify that something is actually a table? How do I identify if that top row is a header? And some extra tips on how to really make your, your tables super accessible and super functional um, in your source document. And then there's also the Accessibility Basics. Um, images, I think is what I called it, but it's the alt text document that also covers how you would remediate an image and gives you some more tips and ideas there as well. And if anybody has trouble accessing those, let me know because the accessibility checker said it's great. And my visual chat, you know, my, my quick check with the screen reader said, yep, all the essentials are there but there could still be one of those little goofy things, the color or something that didn't get caught. So feel free to, to send me an email if those are, are difficult. Um, any questions on errors at this point? Or why those three things are so important? I think there's a hand back here. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't know if this is a good question or not, but um, I, I'm just wondering when you use uh, like tables versus like narrative text to describe what's going on in the document. It's just not clear to me. Um, tables are used to display tabular data, so a relationship between two items. Um, you know, the cost of particular, like, but if an individual were in resale, they would have a product list with their cost and then their resale cost. So it'd have three columns, product name, uh, purchase price, and sale price. And there's a direct relationship between the top row, the top row, that column header, and the left row. So where those data points come together. That's all, ta all that tables should be used for. And the table header is that first row. So it provides context to, if you're in row 110 on page 5, um, and you have forgotten, is my purchase price or my sale price, which, which is in which column, you can look at the top real quick and see that header to get that context. Where if you're on page five and you have to flip all the way back to page one, you have to flip back and forth. Um, that that can cause some problems for most people accessing document tables like that. But for people who use screen readers, that would mean 110 keystrokes to go back to that top row and listen to what that top row was supposed to be if they had forgotten. So that header per will tell the assistive technology the header every time they move across from the, the row. It'll tell them, this is your purchase price column. So it, get, it provides more context without having to navigate back 110 rows to find it. D does that answer? Yeah. Okay. That's about it. No other questions? Nobody on Zoom? <clears throat> nope. So that moves us on to warnings. Um, there's more table stuff in our warnings. And the checker looks for, do links have meaningful text? I'm not sure how the automated checker ensures that the text is meaningful. I think it just looks and says, is there a link here, yes or no, and then kind of indicates you need to check the text of this link to make sure it makes sense. And then some warnings related to tables. Um, are your tables simple, or do they contain merged and split rows 
Are they nested? Uh, and then do your tables use blank cells or columns or rows to space things? And how are you creating your white space elsewhere in the document? When you want a blank line above and below a heading, are you leaving a blank line there? Uh, these things can all make accessing a document difficult for assistive technology users. So meaningful link text, meaningful link text. What is it and why is it important? Um, how many times do you see in a document, um, click here to learn more about um, aerospace engineering. I think it's probably because my rebel's an astronaut that I've got it's a, it's the aerospace on the mind. But, um, and and the, t the link that you see, the blue text that you see to click says, click here. That's all it says. So you have to read the whole line in order to know that if you click here, you're going to learn more about aerospace engineering. For um, assistive technology users, the text of the link click here, does not sufficiently tell them where they're going to go if they click here. It'd be like just open, you're walking down the hall, no door, no wave point signs on the doors, no room numbers, no windows, so you can't peek in to see what's in there. So you're in an unfamiliar building, you have to stop and open every door. Uh, really inconvenient in the physical space. And that is the equivalent. When a link simply says, click here or learn more, uh, those are not descriptive. They are not meaningful. And they don't tell the user where they're going to go. So the entire statement, click here to learn more about aerospace engineering, would need to be the text of the link. That whole thing would need to be linked uh, in order to make that more meaningful. And it'll provide that context to particularly assistive technology users so that they know where that click here is going to go. And the again, assistive technology users, uh, it can be helpful for anybody who, who struggles with um, creating context or inferring context from a line like that. But it can also, for screen reader users in particular, they can tell their screen reader, I only want to see the links on this page. So if there are 50 links in the document that all say click here, that's 50 doors that that screen reader user has to open in order to find what they're looking for. Rather than having each of those say click here to learn more about aerospace engineering, click here to learn more about culinary arts, that kind of thing. Um, so again, it's super important, that link text. But if you don't have any links, does this apply to your document? No. So again, like you got to consider what is in my document, and do I really need to pay attention to this? Simple tables. What do I mean by simple tables? And why is it so important? Um, I'm going to take a break while Nick switches out the battery or the microphone so we don't lose our captioning. OK. Right. So tables can be simple or complex, or they can be used for layout. Uh, a simple table was like I described earlier, just two items to reference. It's that column header and your row header, and those two items to reference data together. Complex tables might have multiple um, different sections, but be all one table. They might all have the same column header, but you might divide um, say, let's see, if I wanted to, I could create a table that had uh, category, respondents, 
uh, number of respondents and percent of respondents. And it can have a category for United States. And then underneath of that, I would have JAWS users, NVDA users, Windowize users. And then in my um, third column, I would have my percentages. So I know it's like 46.6% of people in the world use JAWS. So in the US, that might be closer to 60%. But in that same table, after eight underneath my row for um, Window Eyes users, I might jump to UK users. And then UK users are using JAWS and VBA Window Eyes. That becomes a very complex table because I have different categories. Um, they can also become nested, and I'm not going to describe nested because it's just too much if you're not looking at it, and I don't have a good example. <laughs> um, but those, those become too complex because your table in Microsoft Word can only have one table header, or one column header, basically. The table header and column header are used interchangeably, and it drives me bonkers. <laughs> Uh, so, but that, that's a limitation of our current text editors, is that we can only have one row designated as a header for the column. Readers who struggle with visual perception, who struggle with short-term memory or organization, may may not be able to interpret more complex tables because of the necessary pieces of that table that provide context and structure. Um, so again, keeping the tables simple is super important. If you are able to, if you have tables with multiple categories like I was describing, um, where your column headers are exactly the same but you have different categories, Consider breaking those out into separate tables. It'll simplify the organization for all readers. Yes, it's going to make your document longer, but it will simplify the information for, for all of your users. Um, I grouped the next two items together, the blank cells and repeated characters because the purpose of a blank cell or row or column in a table is to create white spaces, to create boundaries, to provide visual context and visual reference for people who are able to visually perceive the table. For users of assistive technology, that white space is announced as a blank. And for most assistive tech counter two or more blank spaces, they assume that there is no more content. Uh, the lack of information within a data table can also cause confusion. It can tell uh, the user might go, well, isn't there supposed to be data here? Aren't it? Aren't I supposed to know what the purchase price was uh, in this particular cell? Because the column header might be purchase price. But there might be a blank row uh, that is placed to separate categories. And they're like, well, what's the purchase price? There's supposed to be data here. So it can cause confusion. And uh, the same thing can also happen when you use blank lines, extra spaces, and extra tab marks to line the things up in your document. Um, I, I'm guilty. I used to create Microsoft Word forms, and I would type out name, colon, space, 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 bunch of underlines, tab, date, colon, space, space, bunch of underlines. Um, that extra white space makes it very difficult for a screen reader user to navigate. And added complication there, if somebody's filling that form out electronically 
and they go type their name on where those underlines are, it pushes your underlines. And then their name's not underlined, and your formatting's shot. Uh, but if you use tab marks to line things up, and you go to make that large print, things don't aren't lined up anymore. Uh, same thing with, with space, using the space multiple times to create that white space that you need visually to separate information. That is, white space is very valuable. But how you create it can make or break the experience for assistive technology users. Um, your Accessibility Basics tutorials doesn't cover the white space other than just reminding you not to use it. <laughs> so. Um, in the tables, the um, Accessibility Basics tables, I do include some tips on how to uh, max or create your white space without those blank cells, but I don't cover the, that with the tab and the spaces uh, and the blank lines either. But it is, it is important to know you can use paragraph spacing to create extra white space, so instead of Pressing return twice to create that white space, you can select the text and go to paragraph formatting and say, I want X number of lines after blank. Uh, but creating that, that white space that way improves that user experience for people who use assistive technology. So you're saying tabs would not? That's no, tabs do not work. So, as, soon, as soon as you were to increase the font size for any reason, say you have somebody with low vision who, who comes in and wants to access that document, um, and so you go, you go into your Word doc and you make it larger for them and print it off, now your tabs aren't lined up anymore. So it, they lose that, that same context um, because they're, they're not lined up. Properly. You could set it up as a table. Yes. Yep. Yeah, table is one of the best ways to get around the tab thing. And you can hide the grid lines so it won't print when you print it out. And that, that can easily solve that problem. All right, so moving on to tips is our next location. So any other questions about warnings? In the room again, please feel free to, to speak up because I'm not going to see your hands. <laughs> you, you understand the whole difference between tabs, right, and where you would go for all that? Okay, it's, it's pain. It's definitely pain, but that's where you're coming in with styles and met, changing right. those headings. You can make that every new document you start, you can apply those settings. So it's worth it to spend the time to do it, but yes, it is tedious. And I, I do think in the heading, the accessibility basics headings document, I do believe I put in there how to set your, your heading styles as a template. How to modify. I can't remember if I did or not. But um, those those types of things. And Nick and I are working to create additional tutorials like this. I know a couple of like the tables tutorial got a little bit long for the, the basics. Um, I think it was like nine pages. So it was a little bit longer than we'd like. But um, I use heading structure, so you can quickly you know, pull up the navigation pane and jump to a particular section more quickly that way as well. So you don't have to scroll through nine pages. But uh, definitely things we can add to those. So. I think we're good. OK. All right, so tips. These are the things that Microsoft suggests that you do to enhance your customer's reading experience. Uh, this includes uh, captioning for multimedia. So if you drop a video in the middle of your Word document or PDF file, uh, avoid watermarks. Are your headings in a logical order? They might be there, but are they logical? And if you happen to use layout tables, which we don't encourage, but if you can't get away from using a table for layout, for placing images where you want them in a document, um, make sure that they're not circular. 
And identification of what? I apparently missed a bullet point. <laughs> um, so first question people ask me is, why shouldn't I use a watermark? This is very valuable to, to what, we're, you know, what we're doing and, and the content that we're putting out. Um, why shouldn't I use a watermark? And the simple answer is that for some individuals with visual processing challenges, that image because to them is part of the text. So there might be a line, vertical line, that goes, splits down between two letters in a word. And now they're looking at this word that they think has an extra letter in it. This is also true for screen, uh, screen magnifier users who magnify the screen in order to read things. And now they can only see a fourth or less of the screen. So they don't see the whole picture. They just see this little bit. And it looks like an extra letter or a strike through, like something's not supposed to actually be there. Like it's being struck out. So watermarks can, can cause a lot of confusion. Um, I encourage people, if you do need some sort of watermark for, say, um, to identify an important policy document as a draft, for example, um, put it in the header or footer of the document. The, the header or footer, um, and then elsewhere in the document, um, you might repeat periodically in the text that this is a draft in order for those who don't access the, the headers and footers, because assistive technology simply ignores headers and footers unless the user tells it, go read the header to me. So uh, if I, as a screen reader user, were re reading the draft a new policy that's been drafted for Department of Labor procedures for working with people with disabilities, for example. Um, you might put periodically after a heading that this is just a draft, just that little reminder in the text. Uh, it's one extra step when you get ready to publish to have to go through and find and remove every occurrence of the word draft. Microsoft's find and replace feature is pretty awesome for stuff like that. But um, it, it definitely makes it more clear to the reader who doesn't have access to that visual indicator that says this is a draft. Just to let you know, I, I think that's just an added word. There is no identification of any. That's just, it's like, oh, something happened. No problem. I had something going on in my mind. Just I probably actually I probably got distracted by a toddler. Probably more than, <laughs> more than likely. I probably got asked to go build blocks or play superheroes. Um, so the tips, again, coming back to headings, and we touched on this a little bit in the errors piece. Um, I use heading styles. Isn't that enough? Haven't I done my job? Sheesh, get up with that. Um, but again, let's flash back to seventh grade English composition. Who got sick and tired of outlines being drilled into your head. <laughs> and I was a, I was a uh, public communications and journalism major. So <laughs> I was very, very sick of outlines. But there, there is great importance in that outline and identifying your main topics and each of your subtopics within that topic. And because that creates logic for that composition. But the same thing is true for your assistive technology users. The heading levels are identified to assistive technology users. Um, screen readers will say, um, give it heading level one, so the user knows this is a, a main level topic. Users with any cognitive impairments and who might struggle with organization they might go into Microsoft Word and on the View tab, click the box for the navigation pane where they can see the outline. And that outline is generated by the headings. So they can see what are my main topics? And then what are those subtopics? Because they're indented, just like they would be if you wrote out that outline. So um, it is important to go back through 
and look at your headings and make sure that the text represents, the text of that heading, is this a main topic or some subtopic? Uh, it's also important to avoid skipping heading levels. We don't get that as much in um, our, our document composition as we do on the web because our web pages are split into different sections where our documents are almost always strictly compositions. But there have been times where I've, I've opened up a document and um, there's two main topics and then suddenly there's a level three heading. Well, what was that referenced to? Like what's that subtopic of? Um, it, so without that, with that context, I don't know what that subcategory is. Um, or I assume that that becomes the subcategory and then I get really confused because the next heading is a level two. So that logical order um, is created by which level of heading that style that you use. Microsoft Office offers you headings one through six. Uh, typically, you don't see heading styles four, five, and six until you have applied a level three heading somewhere. So if you click on styles in Microsoft Word, you're like, she's lying, there's only three heading styles. Add a, apply a heading three and you'll get four, five, and six will pop up, at least four. Um, so if you want to do a um, special, you know, some kind of formatting, um, you need to, you need to call it heading one, is that right? You don't just make up your own heading name when you're setting up styles. Right. The, the, the best thing to do really is to modify the existing style. So if you have, um, what I do is I go through and I make it look the way I want without the styles applied. And then I go back to my subtopic and I select it. I go up to styles and I right click level two. And the very first option is um, update heading two to match selection. And then every time I apply a level two, it looks exactly like what I formatted. That's the quickest way to do it. It's, it saves a ton of time because creating styles <laughs> is not easy and they can easily become corrupt. Um, I, I had a whole computer crash because my styles became corrupt. Um, I had to wipe a whole operating system. I don't know how or why, but that's ultimately what ended up happening. So uh, that's the quickest, easiest way to, to make that happen within an individual document. And then if that becomes like a department standard, um, you can create a template. So all the headings match that departmental standard look. And you can set, you can actually set, um, have IT on every person's computer within the agency. IT can go and make that template the default. For every user, so that you don't have those inconsistencies from one content creator to another. Um, State Department of Education has done that with all of their their documents. They have document templates, and um, IT has set the default to be what State Department of Education has defined as um, their fonts and their colors and, and that kind of thing. So. I have apparently an excited puppy dog over here. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time I go through errors, warnings, and tips, people are often like, okay, now great, how do I do it? So this last slide within this section is provides a uh, list of their, their links to different remediation resources. Uh, they, in, in addition to the resources that I included, those accessibility basic documents, these would be additional resources that, that could assist you. And I tried to pick the ones that were most straightforward. But what's straightforward to me might not be straightforward to everybody else. So hopefully you can find something within there that works for, it works for you. And um, if any of these particular remediation items are of particular interest, 
to you or your organization, feel free to, to let um, in your, your survey, let us know that can help us determine future IDOC training offerings. Um, and you can always, if you don't put it in the survey, feel free to, to email myself or Nick directly as well, or the IDAC consortium um, at Gmail email address that was used to send out the uh, materials. You can also send it, send it there. It goes to myself and Nick and our co-chair Lori all received those. So that would get to any of us as well. Okay, so this, this moves us on to our Adobe stuff. And we will not get into WAVE today because uh, we only have a half hour left and this is huge. So no. fortunately, a lot of it we'll be able to go through a little quicker because we've already covered why are headings, table headers, link text, why are these things even important? So we've covered a lot of that. Now it's just understanding what how Adobe presents that to you. So your Adobe Acrobat or your Adobe Accessibility Checker is available in all Adobe products. I'm covering specifically Acrobat again from the Acrobat um, Pro perspective because most of the time that's what's being used to generate and check the PDF files that are that you guys are using to distribute PDFs to your consumers. Um, Adobe has this little statement to cover themselves. <laughs> While the accessibility checker helps evaluate the accessibility of a document, that may be, um, it looks for items that may be in conflict with Adobe's interpretation of the accessibility guidelines. So they're even saying, this is our interpretation of these guidelines. <laughs> I don't know what he did with his toys. Um, but the checker also says, you know, we, we don't guarantee that this will put you in 100% compliance. Um, that's, that's another thing. That's the, yeah, there, CYA. <laughs> so kind of mine to really. Um, so to enable the accessibility checker, First, it's best to enable the accessibility tools checker. You can do that by uh, going to view and tools, and, um, or in Adobe Acrobat Pro, you can, there's a little black arrow in what would be the scroll bar on the right hand side. If you click that, that opens up tools. And there's a search box at the top, you type accessibility, and it'll open the accessibility pane for you. Open the Accessibility Tools panel and you'll see several different options, which includes Full Check. After you um, activate the option for a Full Check, you would choose whether or not to create an accessibility report, which would be a document stored in your Documents folder. Great option if you are um, trying to track improvements in your the, the whole data metrics thing, trying to track that information, and you have to provide that report and information to someone else. You don't necessarily have to force it to generate the report. It'll run the checker, and you'll see a report within the Acrobat Pro window where it'll help you fix any potential problems, but um, not create that extra document in your documents folder. If you do choose to create a report, you might want to create an accessibility reports folder in your documents folder and then choose where that report goes. So it's not just randomly dropped in your documents folder because a lot of times the file names don't make sense. So you'll open up your documents one day and go, what is that? <laughs> um, if a report is to be generated, decide if you want it it to literally be identified with the PDF files. So uh, when you go open the report, does it also open the PDF file? You don't have to have that be the case. 
then you would choose whether to check the entire document or only part of the document. I know a lot of our agencies are working with 300 plus page documents. You might want to take bite this off one section at a time. Uh, 300 pages of potential errors is incredibly overwhelming. There are different categories of potential errors and you can decide whether the checker actually checks for those errors or not. This can save you some time. If you know that your document has no tables, then you would uncheck that category because you don't need to see that in your report. It doesn't have tables. Um, if your document doesn't have links, you can have that piece skipped. So um, you can go through the, the different categories and uncheck the things that don't exist in your document. And then you would click the start checking button to initiate the report. For each of the items that you have it checked for, you can see whether it has passed, passed manually, skipped by user, or it needs manual check, or it totally failed. Uh, so when you see an item that says it needs a manual check, once you've checked it, you're like, oh, that's, that's good, or you fix it, and then you go, okay, it's good, you can check it as passed. So you could say, yeah, you identified this as an error, but it really wasn't, um, and, but that, that whole report will give you these, these different options. One of the nice things about the report is that a lot of the items that might show as failed can automatically be fixed from within the report. You can right click the item in the report and click fix. Your options are to skip it, have it explained to you, so if you forget why it's important, um, or you, and then you can also check again. And the options dialog box um, will also it'll pull up the checker again where you can check what items you want the checker to look for and which ones you don't. There are some items that are not identified by WCAG as important, but that Adobe has identified as important. The biggest one is the character encoding. Um, I'm still trying to understand exactly what they mean by character encoding. Basically, what I'm understanding is, is the font that you use installed on the end user's computer, uh, which you have no control over. So uh, definitely kind of something to, that is one that, that can kind of be ignored because it has no bearing on compliance with WCAG. Lane, we have a question on the chat. What does the auto tag feature do? That is beyond the scope of the accessibility checker, but the auto tag feature will um, apply tags. So in a PDF document, everything on that piece of paper is considered to be an element um, and has to be tagged as an element. Hopefully as we go on, that'll make a little bit more sense. It's, it's a little bit beyond the scope of the checker. But we do touch on it as we, we talk about what's, you know, what's important. So um, the, the hard part about Adobe checker and report is that at this point, um, before you even run the report, run the checker, you kind of have to understand the categories and each of the items within the category to even know if you need to check for it. So this gets a little, this gets a little weird. The categories I'm talking about that it looks for are some document properties, which Microsoft, if you noticed, didn't check for any properties. Um, the other, one of the other categories it looks at is your document content, proper structure of forms, tables, and lists, an appropriate use of alt text for images, charts, graphs, and appropriate use of headings. 
And again, I put out here, just remember that some items can automatically be fixed within the checker. Your document properties, uh, you want to look for the accessibility flag, that the document is not an image, and that the document is tagged. Your document structure, uh, which is created by your tags, provides a logical reading order, so it's going to make sense when you're reading through it, and that your text language is specified. Uh, title is present in the title bar, and that, you're, that there are bookmarks present in documents 21 pages or longer. Um, it also says it looks for color contrast, but be aware that you can't change your color contrast within PDF. You have to do that from the source document, so that, that is one that cannot be fixed from within the checker. These are all things, <coughs> aside from color, that were not checked in Microsoft Office. Uh, if you're running a version of um, Office 2016 or earlier, your color isn't checked in the, the Microsoft Accessibility Checker, but if you have Office 365 or Office 2019, um, it will tell you if there's a contrast problem, so it can be fixed right there in the source document. We didn't touch on that much uh, in the Microsoft Checker. Another quick question, Lane. What is text language? Getting there. Yep. Tags, so but these properties were, were not examined in Microsoft. These are things that Adobe interprets as important, but Microsoft does not. These are things, though, that have WCAG references. They can be referenced directly to a WCAG guideline. So even though we didn't talk about them in Microsoft, you might want to so take a look at your Accessibility Basics documents. You'll see how you can add those properties and save yourself a step once you get to Adobe. Uh, your Accessibility Flag. Um, a lot of us have documents with very legal or very policy procedure driven information that we don't want copied and pasted and manipulated. However, Enabling that security feature disables access by screen reader and assistive technology users. So if you set the accessibility flag and document properties, you get the best of both worlds. Uh, the accessibility flag, um, if it shows as failed in the report, you can right click it and click fix and it will fix it for you. Um, image only PDF. A document can appear to have text, but there might not be fonts associated with the, the PDF file. So we use fonts that you don't have installed on your computer, for example. This makes it an image, not actual text. We also see this when we scan documents into a PDF. They are, it's a big picture of text and pixels that make up letters, but it's not actually text that can be accessed. Um, if that item shows as fail, Adobe can run an optical character recognition process to recognize the characters, but this will require you to skim read, at least skim read, if not reread, and make sure that it didn't create errors, because again, this is a machine automated process that might recognize the letter L as the number one, or vice versa, and change the meaning of text. Tags. Um, tags, tags, tags. Tags are what provide the structure um, and the relationship between the content and the structure of a document. So um, you need to tag a picture as a figure so that the uh, assistive technology user knows this is a picture. Otherwise, it's, it's a non-element that's not necessarily recognized. It also provides the logic of the structure. One such tag, well, some tags include heading tags. Heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four are tags instead of styles in PDF. So those tags are providing um, that logic as well. 
Adobe can automatically tag elements, um, especially if you end up running OCR on an image only. Um, Adobe will automatically tag things. It'll automatically assign tags. So this is, again, a machine automated process. It assumes that this word is a paragraph. I have run across instances where um, it tagged every individual character in the document as its own paragraph. So I literally had to read the document letter by letter. Um, so again, important to check those, those tags and make sure that they are actually meaningful. Tedious process. Um, there is a link in the PowerPoint at this point. Um, or at least it was. It's not showing as a link now. Um, but Adobe has a document called The Basics of Tagged PDF. Hopefully that link works, Nick. It looks like it's here. Okay. I don't want to click it yet, but um, I'll double check it. But I did link to this resource in the slide as well as in the resources slide at the end of this section. Your text language, your primary language of your document, tells a screen reader what language to speak to the end user. If you, have, if you have translated a document into Spanish, but the document language is English, the screen reader and read out loud feature are going to butcher that document. Mm -hmm. um, quesadilla becomes quesadilla, mm -hmm. uh, those kind of basic things. So the ensuring the language of the document tells a system technology what language to speak to the end user. If you happen to have parts of a document that are in different languages, um, you can also specify the language of an individual paragraph. You can automatically fix the document's text language through the checker, but if you need to do individual paragraphs, Honestly, it's easier to do it from your source document. Microsoft Word, um, you select the paragraph and apply the language, and that data moves to Adobe with the, the um, conversion. And it's a whole lot easier to do it there. That is included in your Accessibility Basics documents. Um, some of us save files with names that are meaningful to us as the author, but might not necessarily be meaningful to the end user. In Adobe, you have to specify the title of the document and document properties, whether that's the same name that you used to save the document or a different name. The title that you generate in document properties is the title that will appear in the title of the window. So when the, the PDF opens, the title in properties is the title that will be in that, that blue bar at the top of the window. Um, this title provides context to the user. So instead of just saying PDF file, it tells the, the user that this is what the file is about. Um, Adobe does not present the option to fix the title from within the report. So you'd have to click on file and properties and find the um, title edit box. And document bookmarks, <coughs> this item will be marked as failed if the document contains 21 pages or more, it does not have bookmarks. If you use heading styles appropriately in your source document, in a document that's gonna be 21 pages or longer, bookmarks are automatically inserted into your PDF file, as well as appropriately tagged as the appropriate heading in the tags. So source document is supreme, it's king. <coughs> Um, you can save yourself a ton of time with heading the styles. And then the, la the last document property here, color contrast. Um, if this item fails, it is possible that people with low vision or color deficiencies could have difficulty reading your document. Um, Adobe does not offer the ability to change color within the document, but as Nick and I found, uh, in yeah, come here. Guide dog getting away. Mm -hmm. uh, it, that occasionally some templates automatically 
make link, te link text yellow instead of blue. Yellow on white is not contrast, you know, contrast enough to be, to, to be seen or read for anybody, but especially people with color deficiencies. Any, question, any more questions on those properties without diving too deeply into tags? Doesn't look like it. Okay. So document content, the items that it checks for. <laughs> hey, look, tags again. Um, is all of the content tagged? Does everything on this page have, in this document, have an associated tag? That includes annotations. Is your tab order consistent with your structure order? This is most applicable to documents that contain links and form fields. So if your document doesn't contain links or form fields, a user's not going to use the tab key to read. So little less important. But if your document has links or form fields, you, you got to verify this tab order thing. So uh, that when a user presses tab, they're going to go through in order. Um, I've opened several PDF forms, and uh, the first form field is name. Visually, the second form field is date. But to the screen reader, the next form field is address line two. You can kind of sit there and go, huh? That tab order made no sense. Um, so making sure that when you tab through form fields or links, that focus is moving in a logical order. When you look at it visually, your eye would be drawn to what next? Did my tab key go there? It also looks for reliable character encoding, making sure that the fonts being used in the document are installed on the computer. If you've inserted audio or video, that that content also contains the appropriate tag. And you'll also find that it, it's not looked for, but one additional thing to manually look for, if you include audio or video, um, you need to have captioning or transcripts for people who are hearing impaired. And for video, that video also has to have audio description for people who are unable to, to see what's happening in the video. And make sure that the page will not cause flicker. No accessible, no inaccessible scripts. So if you've put a video in, um, tab has to go to play, pause, fast forward, rewind, mute, captions. The scripts that, that yield those controls um, have to give tab access to them. Your navigation links are not repetitive. It's that meaningful link text again. So we don't have 50 links that say click here. And that your page does not require a time that's supposed to be a response. <laughs> so an annotations um, refer to the Adobe Acrobat uh, repair workflow document that is linked here and can be found on Adobe's help site for more information about specifically what are annotations, what are they used for, and how to really how to make them accessible. The checker just looks, are they tagged or not? Um, every annotation has to be tagged. It's just up to you um, what tag that element should have. So uh, the auto tag might tag something as an annotation that is not. So it might be up to you to change it. Uh, I find that in the uh, documents that I look at from, that are available through LSO every legislative season for every bill, um, their annotations are marked as spans, not as annotations. Um, that, so that tag is, is not an accurate tag. Um, and the tag, again, it reflects what the element is or does. And if an element say a picture, is simply decorative. It lends no context, no meaning whatsoever. Um, it just fills white space and looks pretty. Then um, it also needs to be marked as an artifact so that your assistive technology users simply don't encounter it. 
So your tab order. Uh, we talked a little bit more about that. When you use tab key to navigate the document, it can move to interactive tagged elements in the document. That includes links and form controls primarily. Uh, it can also include data cells within a table. So as you visually scan the document, uh, what would you look at next? Again, I'll use that form field as an example. Name edit box, the date edit box would be how you would, would fill that out. They sit left, you know, left right on that line, but to the screen. So if you would logically go from name to date, press the tab, you put click in the name, and then press tab. If tab goes anywhere other than date, your tab order is not logical. It's not, and it's not following structure. Um, this is one of the last things I recommend that people do because as you remediate a PDF, um, you might change the structure a little bit. So if you do this, this feature first, fix, which you can fix from within the checker or the report, uh, there's, if you click fix, there's an option to make a tab order match structure. If you do that first, and then you go change your structure, they don't match anymore. So this is one of the last things I tell people to do, even though it appears higher in the list of, of items. Uh, this is important, but it's one of the last things you want to do with the document before you get ready to publish it. Yep. So if you verify the tag structure, tab order should follow suit. But if you're changing your tag order as you remediate, you want to come back in and, and do this. Um, ta you know, make tab order match structure again. Okay, your tagged multimedia. In addition to having the appropriate tag for multimedia, the video also itself has to be accessible. So it has to have captioning, transcript, and or audio description. Your screen flicker um, includes animations or scripts that, or like quizzes, that kind of thing that might show up in a PDF file. Um, you gotta make sure that they aren't going to cause a flicker and cause somebody with photosensitive epilepsy to have a seizure. That wouldn't be very good. It can also cause challenges for low vision users who are magnifying the screen. Um, that flicker can move the visual focus around and they, they might not actually be able to enter information within a script or, or that kind of thing. Uh, there is no way to fix this within Adobe. It must be fixed within the source script, source document, and, and or source file. Scripts and timed responses. Uh, there are widgets for testing knowledge, doing quizzes, that kind of thing that get added into some PDF files. Uh, or, as I mentioned before, sometimes some video players are scripts within that PDF file for play, mute, um, that kind of thing. Those are all scripts that your, your developer, most of us are not doing scripted stuff. But if you have a developer who is doing scripted stuff for you, they've got to make sure that the elements within that script are accessible and can be tabbed to, and that the tab key doesn't get stuck within that script either. Um, that they can get back out into the text of the document to read it. This can also include time limits on a particular activity within a PDF file. Um, if you want more information about scripts, uh, check out the Adobe file called uh, Applying Actions and Scripts to PDFs. Again, that's probably something that'll be beyond what the IDAC and IATP are ever able to present. It's, it's going into some more developer type of, of training. But as the proofreader and final content owner of that document, it's up to you to check it. So 
if your document has those things, run the checker, and if it fails, send it back to your developer. And I, I hesitate. I'm not sure if I should ask a question, but I, I do have a question about that. Okay. Um, for a variety of reasons, mostly due to security, we have applications that have timeouts, um, the, the timeout and authentication certificate, or timeout because the use is on a public computer and we don't want someone to walk away and leave their personal information on the screen. And at what point? do we need to accommodate versus you know, address the security concern? The best thing to do in those situations is as the deadline approaches, have a pop-up dialogue that comes up that says there's 30 seconds remaining in this session. Do you want to continue? And the screen reader will pick that up and, yep. okay, yeah, yeah, you, yep. we're doing that. Yep. The, it depend, it, Depending on how it's done, but most of the time the screen reader picks that up. Uh, the developer can force focus to it if it's a JavaScript pop-up. Uh, and then if it's a Windows pop-up, focus automatically goes to it anyway. But that's, that's the best solution because if the user, if it just goes away, the user's really stuck in a hard spot. But um, if, and if they're given the option that, oh, I'm almost out of time, I need to interact, um, that gives them the option that not to lose their work. Um, and But if they're not sitting there anymore, and they've walked away, then... But we want to close it down. Yeah. Then it would close it down. So it addresses both. It's not a perfect solution, but it, uh, it, it's addressing that, that need. Um, your navigation links in your PDF checker. Um, this could fail for several, several reasons. If the tags <coughs> the text as the link are not appropriate, it could be marked as failed. And if there are several links with the same text or that are identified as going to the same place, um, then the, this item could be marked as failed. So this would require then going through and looking at each of your links and making sure that when you click on them, they go where you want them to go. And if it happens to catch it because you've got six links in a six-page document that go to the same web page, and that's what you want, then you can mark this as manually passed. <coughs> Um, the accessibility panel can help you start identifying these and applying appropriate tags if the problem is if it's failed because the tag is wrong. Um, you start looking for that. It'll help you figure that out in the, the checker. And check out um, links and attachments in PDF files for more information. Again, this is linked in the slide. Um, and in the res on the resources slide of this section. And be aware that it's probably easier to fix links in your source document than it is to fix links in your PDF file. Your so the next category it looks at, structure of forms, tables, and lists. If your, tables do, if your PDF file does not have form fields, tables, or lists, then you have the option of unchecking this category. It looks to make sure that your form fields have tags and labels and descriptions, that the tags within a table are all properly nested, and that all of the tags that are associated with list items are appropriate. It also makes sure that your table have headers and that your um, tables all all rows in your table have the same number of columns. This is why you want to avoid merged rows and split or merged columns and split columns in your table creation. Also that your tables have summary. Okay, so tag, 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 tag. <laughs> uh, 
Make sure that the tag of an edit box is for an edit box. Make sure the tag of a checkbox is for a checkbox uh, so that they perform their proper function. They also have to have an appropriate label so that when assistive technology goes into them, it reads out what they are actually supposed to do. Am I supposed to type my name here or am I supposed to type my address here? Uh, if your PDF has forms, your, it sucks, but your best bet is to clear all the tags in your document and tag it yourself. Um, it is very time consuming, however, the auto tags for forms are almost always wrong. And they end up in the wrong tag order in the tag tree, so then your tab structure gets all screwed up, your logical reading order is screwed up. Just, it affects everything. Um, form descriptions are required, so when you hover the mouse over a form field, a description appears. Um, you can add the descriptions directly in the accessibility panel when the checker is open. For more information on ex making accessible forms, because I am definitely not the expert in making forms, Check out Acrobat Pro DC Accessible Forms and Interactive Documents. Again, this is linked in the slide. Your table tags, table tags and relationships. We talked a little bit more about relationships uh, in the Microsoft section, but you have to be even more detailed in the tags in tables and PDF files, and you're given the option to make row headers in PDF files as well. Those tags are what give the reader context and, and help them actually make sense of all of the numbers and data in the middle of the table because it'll read the, what is that row header on the left, it will read what is that column header at the top without forcing them to navigate to it. So. Um, for more information on understanding tables, check out the um, Web Accessibility Initiative document, PDF 6, Using Table Elements for Table Workup. That document can also be applicable to anybody who's creating HTML tables for web, uh, for web files. Table regularity is a pass or fail. Uh, does your table have the same number of col columns in every row? Yes or no. If it doesn't, you can choose to say it passes anyway if you want to, because you can, using this call span tags, fix what looks like what is not right. Um, again, that's addressed in that PDF 6 and how you can use those tags to address this column issue. Um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services also has a huge guide on PDF documents. And the table section is phenomenal in describing the more detail, the tags, and how to apply the calls, the COL spans and that kind of thing to fix this irregularity problem. Table summaries are considered to be optional unless that data cannot be understood without a description. Um, so you have a complex table with nested tables, multiple categories, you're going to want a summary of that table that tells assistive technology users to expect this to be a difficult table and this is why and that will give them some context so that they can navigate it. Um, every list item has is, is nested. It's got three tags that have to be applied to it. So if your list is, um, you know, colors of the rainbow, and there's a bullet between in front of each of them, there has to be a label tag, or a, sorry, a list tag that says list starts here. Then there has to be a tag that says. Um,
the LBL or list label has to be identified as a bullet so that the bullet is identified to the assistive technology user so that they know this is not a numbered list and must be done in order. And then there's an L body tag that says this is the actual text of this list item. So you have to, to have every one of those nested properly and they have there has to be something. Even if your list doesn't have bullets or numbers, there has to be an LBL tag. Um, WAI, the Web Accessibility Initiative, or W3C, um, has created a list tags document. It's called PDF 21. Using list tags in PDFs. Um, again, link on the slide. And then our last category, alt text and headings. This one we get to breeze through because you know all about alt text and headings now, right? Uh, sometimes alt text may never be read because it's nested inside of something else. So if there's a picture inside of a table and you put alt text on that picture, it's not going to be read because it's nested inside of a table. Um, alt text must be associated with context, and, uh, content, it can't just randomly exist. And unfortunately, in PDF, you can make alt text just randomly exist. Uh, and then your alt text should not hide your annotations. So uh, again, it comes into, is that annotation tag nested in something? Uh, if that annotation is nested inside of a list, the annotation will be hidden if the list has alt text. Um, and then the last item, appropriate heading nesting, that logical heading order again. Um, are they the relationship between level one, level two, level three clear? Your figures must be identified as or tagged as figures. If the image adds content or meaning to the content, content of the document, it needs to have alt text that describes its purpose. But if it's simply decorative, it can be marked as an artifact rather than a figure. It's always good to review the alt text of a figure because, again, it might not be what you expect. Um, I talked a little bit about this nested tags and the annotations and alt text. Uh, if, a, if a figure appears within a table, it's considered to be nested and the alt text will not be read. The accessibility or the, the PDF accessibility repair workflow in the PDF or Adobe help um, section of their website has a section designated to adding alternative text for more information. And then this associated with content thing again, um, manually identify tags to make sure that they, they have alt text if they require it and don't have alt text if they need it, if they aren't supposed to have it. <coughs> um, and then there's the other elements to um, check this will make sure that there are no other tagged elements in the document that require alt text. This may, the, the alt text stuff almost always appears as a manual check in the report. <coughs> uh, and again, remember this machine, it can only check that headings exist it can't decide for you if they are in the proper order. This last slide, um, slide 66, has all of the links that were on the slides, it has all of them listed, plus a couple extras to help with the context because it's just, there, there's just too much. But really, as you get ready to, to generate an accessibility report in Adobe, you have to consider what does my document contain and can I skip it? Do I even have to worry about it? So if your document doesn't have links, forms, lists, you can uncheck all of those items and look for what's important.
Okay, um, slide 67 has more resources. <laughs> it's a big list. So, in conclusion, accessibility checkers and reports are simply a starting point. They're to get you to start thinking about what barriers might exist and how you can remediate those. Um, they, the Adobe checker gives you some options to fix things right there and fix it for you. Um, and almost all of the checkers are going to provide you some explanation. Hopefully, I mean, there's no way you're going to remember everything that I tossed out today. This is a ton of information. Um, so hopefully those explanations, explanations provided by the checkers and the reports can enhance and, and jog your memory a little bit as to why these things are super important for your users who might use assistive technology to access your content. I know we've run over. My apologies. <laughs> um, it, this is a very big topic, and it's, it's difficult to cover in a short period of time. So hopefully, um, if you could please fill out your surveys, let us know how, how we did. Um, we greatly appreciate feedback, even if it's negative, because we always want to get better. And if you were, uh, did not sign in, please um, add your information in the, on the sign-in sheet. I'll make sure that you get just an indicator that you attended the training. So um, if you happen to track your accessibility training within your organization, you'll have that. Um, and if you parked in the ramp and you don't want to have to pay for parking yourself, you want to give that survey to Nick. <laughs> Completed survey, sorry. Nick's going to verify that they're completed, too. <laughs> uh, and for anybody online, um, I will also send out an electronic survey. So anybody online, we will get that out to, to you guys as well. I just sent it to chat, but probably oh, I did it to Nick just sent the survey link through chat, and we can follow up, and I can include it in the email as well. So if you think of anything later, you can add it in that survey online as well. Lane, did you already address my what you said about the copy of the PowerPoint? Uh, the PowerPoint was emailed yesterday. Uh, it was emailed in Google Slides. So the email that you got, Scott, it's a link at the bottom gotcha. of the, and we'll send out the PowerPoint again uh, after after today. <laughs>